Thank you, and good morning. So smarter cities, everyone's talking about them, but we're gonna have a little bit of a chat today about focusing on the how, and not so much the why and the what. The why and the what is being sold all the time, which is fantastic, but we need to get the how happening. Now, we all live in cities, we're in a small city here, and cities are now representing 50, more than 50% of the population. So, huge focus. But cities come in all shapes and sizes and at all stages of evolution. So they're not starting at the same point. And smarter cities, in fact, should be more about being a, a verb in a sense, not so much a noun, as in smarter and becoming smart. So because we want to move, we want to move forward. So why do we actually focus so much on the why? And why are smart cities a good idea? Well, first of all, everyone's doing it. Private sector, public sector, cities all around the world, everyone's got a smart city initiative. There's a smart city conference going on every week. I guess I'm kind of at one right now. So it's all happening. But the interesting thing is, we still don't even know what it is. Last week, some NUS students actually counted the number of definitions on smart cities worldwide. They came up with 132 different definitions, which kind of says to me that we I think we kind of overthink things and sort of get hung up on that. I think it's probably a little bit easy to just simply say a smart city is really about doing more with less. Now, there's groups worldwide which are helping each other and sharing knowledge, city groups helping cities, private sector with academia, all working together, trying to do things, trying to actually get the knowledge sharing going because that's how we tend to actually achieve things. We learn from each other. So, lots of activity, lots of people doing things. And the reason we tend to do this is because cities are expensive to maintain. Cities are expensive to actually build in the first place. Concrete is expensive. Power lines are expensive. Toilets, I've found out today, are expensive. In England, they're looking at building a, a new sewer under the Thames, effectively at a cost of 10 new public hospitals. So, Lots of choices, lots of decisions, but lots of cost. And technology tends to come into the discussion at this point because everyone basically sees that technology will help me do more with less. I don't have to build that new sewer. I don't have to build that new road. There is no need for the road because now everyone's working at home and using technology to, to commute effectively. And we've found with lots of research that technology will actually be the key to this. So some studies have shown that 15% of greenhouse gas emissions in cities will be reduced if basically we just connect everything using the smart ICT technologies that are available. Other studies are indicating billions and trillions of dollars of value in cities that can be realised by the use of big data and simply connecting everything. So there's lots of good reasons why we should have a smart city and why we should try to focus on the smart cities. So what are we actually seeing around the world in the smart cities? I was lucky enough to work on Mazda City, a $20 billion zero carbon development. At the time we had 500 consultants and engineers working on it, trying to actually work out how do we do this? How do we make it carbon zero? How do we make it a wonderful city to live in? Balance all of those things. It's very complicated. The good news is some of the buildings are going up, uh, the campus has been built, and it's a very good example of some truly sustainable buildings. And it's very, very smart. It's using ICT to control things, but providing a great quality of life. So the ICT is with us everywhere. We're surrounded by it in this room. It's controlling everything we see. We walk out into the streets, everyone's now got iPhones and smartphones with augmented reality, it's, it's pervasive. It's in the parks, it's in the gardens, it's in the factories, it's in our offices. We really can't escape it. There's iPads everywhere here today. So we know it's here. But what we haven't quite got to yet is what we call hyper-connectivity. So we're in the world of connectivity at the moment, but when we get into hyper-connectivity, that's when people, processes, data, and things will actually start to be connected 
And that's kind of really freaky, interesting, amazing, wonderful, because it's going to do things that we just haven't been able to do. And we're going to see things that we haven't seen before. And I find it very interesting when we see not so much big brother as little brother, the impact of um, everyone or everybody or every dog or any cat being connected and feeding information back into the big data cloud. So it's all happening and it's all possible to happen. But the trick is, how will it happen? Most of the talk around smart cities is about the why and the what. And people are inventing a what. Look at this, look at my shiny new what. Isn't it cool? How do we actually get it into the streets? How do we actually make it affordable? Because cities are so complex. And mayors and all the people, governors, state, federal, everybody who works in the city has multiple issues, whether it's economic growth, safety and security. There's so many different things that have to be sorted out in the city. Because that starting point from the effectively the reality, reality to the vision is a tricky journey to start. And to start that journey, we tend to work on what's called baselines. But words like baselines, benchmarks, get very confusing. You try to need to, if you want to improve your city, make it smarter, you have to start at the beginning. Fine, what is the beginning? How do we define it? And the bottom line is we just need to get from effectively one to two. We need to get better and move forward. But we get a little bit hung up at times on the beginning and exactly plotting where we are. You know, the bottom line is we have to get some movement going. But this, confu this confusion, effectively, is pervasive in the cities. And because everyone's coming together that weren't together previously, it gets confusing. So that's a picture of 45 different opinions on what is important in a smart city from a workshop I did in Barcelona last year. We effectively really got 45 different answers just in that workshop. And there were two other groups in other rooms with another 45 each. Everyone came from a different viewpoint and everybody gave a different response. Because the average city is complex. Now, when we look at that picture of Budapest in Hungary, we see trees, we see water, we see buildings, we see cars, we see people. It's a very nice vista. It's a lovely city too. But if you kind of look at it in a different way, what you actually see is silos that aren't actually all run together. So you see education, you see transport, you see safety and security, you see retail, you see real estate, sports, entertainment, all sorts of things. And all of these components, which actually make up the city, are still effectively silos. And they're operated effectively as separate entities. And to make it even more confusing, each of these silos has multiple stakeholders. For every one of those silos, there's a policy maker, there's a regulator, there's a developer of the asset, there's an owner of the asset, and then there's an operator. They can be the same, they can be different. The point is, it's complex. So I'll take you through a couple of examples of, in a sense, how things are done, and in what role, and who does it. So this is Budapest, this is a state opera house, built in the 1880s by Emperor Franz Joseph, who only turned up at his royal box for 30 minutes, apparently. Point is, it's a classic example of top-down, federally-led infrastructure. Walk around the corner, there's no infrastructure for this food vendor to run his cart. So he powers it with a car battery. That's bottom-up innovation. Similarly, because of the economy in Hungary at the moment, it's actually very attractive to go clubbing and drinking there uh, for a lot of the other Europeans. And then, to make it more interesting, you have all these derelict buildings called ruin bars, where businesses have just flooded in. It's a bottom-up approach. The council have seen how well it's been doing and how much economic impact it's bringing into the city. So they're kind of like saying, well, OK, it's not actually in accordance with our urban planning, but we'll let it go because it's really working. So there's a lot of activity happening there. Similarly, you flip over to Istanbul, and you see a hotel, a hotel motel complex effectively built in the 15th century, called a caravanserai. It was built to allow caravans and traders on trade routes to have somewhere to stay, a 
and maybe sell goods to each other. That was a bottom-up approach. Top-down at the moment, the city of Istanbul is basically trying to work out how do we maintain these buildings and what do we do with all of the now craftsmen who've flooded in to actually make a living and make goods, and uh, basically which are all sold in the Grand Bazaar just around the corner from it. So again, top-down and bottom-up. Similarly, a f fourth century um, uh, effectively a piece of water infrastructure. So Emperor Justinian built that basilica there to house water for uh, the city of Istanbul many, many years ago. And that was a federally led initiative. And then you go to somewhere like Barcelona and macroeconomic conditions are basically making this man, who's a wonderful pianist, play and busk in the street with no support just to make some money. So you then start to look again at where is technology, because I left technology out of that in, intentionally. But you then come into this example where you've got a sensor in the street. That parking sensor will effectively tell you where there's an empty car spot because 40% of traffic in cities tends to be looking for a car park. So it's kind of a good idea to do that to reduce the congestion. The, op the opposite view there is that you see an example of finding out where a parking space is in New York without a sensor being done. It's all just done by crowdsourcing. So you've got this looming confrontation effectively between sensors and crowdsourcing. Which way do we go? One's expensive, one's less expensive, or maybe not. We don't know. It's all about that how. So what we need is a process to get some focus on that. And let's not get too hung up on the what. Let's work out why we do something, what we do, and then how we do it. What are the policies? What are the business models? What are the roles that all the different stakeholders will actually play in that? Now, we've got to build this from the bottom up in the sense of the focus. This is in Barcelona. This is a human tower. But all of the focus is at the bottom. And that's what we've actually got to do to get to the top. Because there's so many things coming. There's so much disruption that is going to take place because of the role of technology. And it's going to require different thinking, different business models. It's not just a matter about saying, it's a great idea, let's do it. It's a matter of saying, how do we do it? One of my favorite authors and a futurist, Arthur C. Clarke, said, I don't pretend we have all the answers, but we should be focusing on all of the questions. Why, what, and how are the questions. But to make the cities truly smarter, let's spend a lot more time on finding the answer for the how. Thank you.